Hey Pier, welcome to episode 3 of the Solar Punk Press Short Fiction Podcast. I originally recorded this intro under a blanket, but unfortunately it just amplifies the sounds of my mouth noises, so we're not going to do that. This recording is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License, which means that you can share it, but don't sell it or change it. Trigger warnings are in the show notes for those who need them. This month's story is The Squeaky Wheel by Sarah Kate Ellis. Sarah Kate Ellis is the 2011 Lambda Emerging Writers Fellow and the winner of the 2015 Defenestrationism Short Fiction Contest. Her stories have appeared in the Red Penny Papers, Ideomancer, Andromeda Spaceways in Flight Magazine, and Cross Genres. She lives in Tokyo with her partner and her cat, Tom, and likes Soba. The Squeaky Wheel is definitely the darkest story we've endeavored to publish yet, and we recommend listeners take a look at the show notes for triggers before listening further. We chose this story as an exploration into solar punk ideology running amok in an imperfect society not yet free of capitalism, and a critique of the dangers this can present. The story also deals with the improper treatment of anxiety disorders and what it means to be an anxious person in a society built to champion extroversion. Narration was done by Nicole Brown, and voice acting was done by Faith Gregory and Nicole. Now, The Squeaky Wheel by Sarah Kate Ellis. The cafe was dim and smelled like rain and shoe polish. Daniele Clyde held her mother's hand tightly as they tripped their way through the crowded arrangement of sofas and easy chairs. Wet umbrellas and backpacks tossed sloppily to the floor were spread before her like mines on a threadbare carpet. But it was the faces she didn't like, the eyes drifting over her as she passed, the women cooing and threatening to reach out and squeeze a cheek, the men visibly irritated by the loss of attention. They both paused as they spotted Daniele's father, half hidden by a spider plant in the old school newspaper he held in front of his face. Final Social Security payouts to occur in 2043, the headline read. He taught Daniele to read just a year ago. It's a way to keep an eye on things, he told her, but it's also an escape when you need it. The only way to guarantee time with people you can stand. She felt her mother's hand on her shoulder heard the fabric of her raincoat rustling as she bent closer, and said with the lightest theatricality, Daddy's hiding from us. Why don't you go surprise him? Already people were noticing. An elderly woman nearby lifted her head from a book. A teenage couple, wearing matching college sweatshirts, looked up eagerly from a pad screen, revealing a fun funds display, just as a raucous fanfare sounded from its tiny speaker. Daniele squinted at the ticker as it added another zero, and the couple looked back down, high-fiving each other. She took a single step forward until the boy shot her a look and winked. Sweetie, Sam said. She had straightened now, was already giving up. He's right there. Daniele tightened her grip on her mother's hand. If she was going to travel that endless plane of eyeballs and whispers and muddy boots, it wouldn't be alone. She glanced up uncertainly, and Sam's strained smile fell to meet her. You're five, Danny, Sam whispered. Almost six. This is getting ridiculous. A waiter, balancing a tray of coffee drinks, cleared his throat behind them, and Sam bent low, slipping her arms under her daughter's and carried her to the corner. Once they were close enough, Daniele dropped to the floor and ducked behind her father's paper. Samantha Clegg watched the paper rustle, watching with mild impatience and a growing emptiness in her stomach as the two of them stayed like that, whispering to each other. The headlines shot out at her like a headache. Governor Kyle vows no more funds for public schools. Monitoring of sex offenders will shift to private firms. For the first time that morning, Sam heard her daughter laugh. The appointment went well, she said. Dr. Lawrence is a good fit for her. The two of them stayed behind the pileup of bad news, and Sam plucked the meal pad from the newly vacated table next to theirs. She tapped in an order of coffee, fruit, and cinnamon toast. Dr. Lawrence had had only an early slot available, and Daniele hadn't eaten more than a yogurt pack. All we have to do is wait for the test results. Her stomach growled, and she craned her neck towards the counter. The waiter was fiddling with a stack of water glasses, resolutely ignoring the flashing red light on the order board. This was what Berto liked about this place, she decided, that he could go unnoticed among so many people. 
Outside, the rain took a violent turn, battering the windows, pouring down the glass in torrents. The whispering behind the paper continued. Roberto, Sam said. There was a pause, and her husband lowered the paper. Yes, he said. Daniele laughed again. He was still handsome, Sam thought, even though his hair was thinning and he was getting soft in the middle. Charm could carry you a long way. Men more than women. Dr. Lauren says he can get Daniele in a program as early as next week. Berto smiled flatly and passed his daughter the newspaper. She clambered off his knees and slipped into the space between his chair and the wall, then set about noisily folding the pages. She steepled them the way he taught her, with one end resting on the arm and the other balanced against the lower ridge of the boiserie so that it formed a tent. His daughter safely distracted, Berto's expression soured. You said it was a psych test for school admission. It was unsettling to see his mood shift, Sam thought, his jaw setting, the mirth in his eyes disappearing. Amid the gloom of the cafe, it was as if they'd turned black. She lowered her voice. You saw her when we came in. Oh, wait. She leaned her head back and snorted. You didn't, did you? She was clinging to me like I was dangling her over a cliff. Not fair, Sam, Berto said. As if on cue, the listless waiter appeared with her order. She reached up and took the tray, plucking a cube of cantaloupe and nearly swallowing it whole. She needed to settle her stomach, to stay calm and make him see reason. You know, she said, taking another piece. The fielder's boy? The one you call the dunce? He just funded his entire trip to Elsinore camp. At six. It was his own campaign, and he, I'm sure his parents had something to do with that, said Berto. Maybe. But Billy Fielders has friends. Lots of them. From playdates from the Christmas pageant, even from that crap public school he goes to. And Sarah Chow, you know, the girl whose mom is a lunch lady? She just funded her first year at Pensy Kindergarten. I don't know why you persist in these comparisons, Berto said. We got Daniele into a much better school than any of those brats, and we can afford it easily. It's not about comparisons, Sam said. What about when she's there and can't make any friends? What happens when she goes to high school or college? Or years from now, when we're gone and she gets a divorce, or needs to keep a business afloat, or fund some serious medical issue. Long game, Berto. She needs friends. Danny has friends, Berto said. Lena is a terrific friend. So is Bryce. Two friends, Berto. Two. Berto leaned over, took a quick glance inside the tent. That's more than anyone needs, he said. More than most people have in a lifetime. Sam stifled a sigh. God, did she have to do everything? Have to think about everything? If you haven't noticed, real friends are a luxury these days. For pampered little boys like yourself. Only you aren't that rich anymore, Berto. She needs to get out there. Build a support network. Now. We're not always going to be here for her. Berto flinched and Sam saw his hands go white. He reached into his pocket and produced a handkerchief, dabbing it at his forehead. Sam felt a wave of guilt wash through her. She hadn't meant for it to sound that harsh. Berto provided a comfortable living for them, one they could retire on, but not enough to secure Daniele's future, and as the youngest child in an old money family, he had neither the motivation nor the instincts to make more. She reached over and lifted a cup of acrid-smelling coffee to her lips. A pinging sound, like the tilt on an old pinball machine, startled her and sent the dark liquid sloshing into her saucer. The two of them watched the teenagers smooch gleefully over their pad screen. How much had they brought in, Sam wondered. Enough for a year's tuition? A study abroad program in Rome? Berto checked once more to see if Daniele was listening. Then he turned back to his wife. Any side effects? Any at all? And we pull her out. When had it changed, Sam wondered. Certainly, the promise that if you worked hard, you'd get somewhere had long been rescinded. As a girl, after her father had left, she'd watched that one recede like her distant memories of movie theaters and libraries. But it used to be that you could still feel adequate as a self, even proud of your decision not to try too hard. People, her mother once told her, the ones who counted at least, would see the good in you. Not anymore. You had to be likable, and not quietly so. It was a full-time job. Sam saw it here in the lobby of the Secure Futures building, an incredible extension of the open office where everyone was on display. 
The entire building was a maze of cubicles and private chambers, separated only by glass walls that gave the impression of an enormous stack of Tupperware. The people inside were stabs of tastefully muted color, spinning like petals in their chairs, darting out from behind bookshelves or hanging plants, as they chatted with careful amiability into their headsets. It reminded Sam of an exhibit she'd seen as a child, the remains of corpses, preserved and sliced open so you could see everything inside, organs and veins, twisting their way around sinew and bone, a network of cells keeping it all together, but dead. She squeezed Danielle's shoulder, watched her child register every flicker of movement through the glass surrounding the reception room. Samantha Clyde? called a woman behind them, and Daniele spun around before Sam's ears registered the sound. So sorry to keep you waiting. Renata Laprior. Laprior was youngish, wore a quail-egg blue suit, and moved with the kind of choreographed grace you'd expect from an old-fashioned etiquette coach. Sam rose to shake her hand and watched her child uneasily as they were ushered into the elevator. Inside Laprior's office, the walls blocked out the rest of the building, shifting into a cascade forest, the grassy scent of juniper berries and pines settling around them as a jay cried somewhere in the distance. Daniele gasped, clambered around on the sofa to take a look. Nothing to worry about, honey. It's a projection, Sam said. Isn't it neat? Daniele looked at her with a mix of disbelief and contempt. How do you know if someone's behind you? Laprior chuckled and took a seat across from them. I know you're a busy woman, Miss Clyde, so I'll get right to it. As Dr. Lawrence told you, Secure Futures offers a two-pronged approach to therapy, a combination of traditional treatment and PR makeover. He told me about the treatment part, said Sam. How does the rest work? After we're certain the medication regimen is working, we start slowly. A few arranged playdates, small at first. Then, gradually, we build up to more populated events with the other children in our care. To your friends, family, and associates, however, it will all come off as natural socialization. Good, Sam said. She cleared her throat softly. My husband is insistent about this being a gradual process. You see, Danielle's a smart girl. Very smart. Other than this developmental issue. She's just so frightened of everyone. La Prior smiled warmly. She leaned over and placed her chilly, manicured hands over Sam's. That's the issue with many of our clients. Fear. All we hope to do is encourage our subjects to see opportunities with the same frequency that they might be alerted to dangers. By the time she finishes with us, she'll have a robust and diverse garden of friends and associates and all the skills necessary to tend that garden, make it flourish well into old age. She smiled down at the girl. You like gardens, don't you, Daniele? Just the bugs, said Daniele. Then she pulled her hand away and shoved it into her pocket. The machine was a fort. That's how her mother told her to think about it. But she didn't feel safe the way she did in a blanket tent at home or up in the tree house she'd built with Daddy. Her hands and feet were strapped down, and there were snakes attached to her head that tickled and writhed as her weight shifted and turned in the cylinder. This was an important part of her treatment, Dr. Lawrence said. Along with the pills, the special light would kick in like a jumper cable, make her happier, make her fun. You're cocooning, he'd said the first time she went in. Soon. And he hooked his thumbs together and fluttered his fingers. You'll be a butterfly. Daniele didn't want to be a butterfly, though. She wanted to be a bee or a grasshopper, something that people left alone, or at least had decent odds of getting away. This wasn't like that. It was already her fifth time, and she didn't feel better at all. But when she woke up in the hospital cot a few hours later, she felt lighter, the way she did on Saturday mornings after a long sleep, the smell of French toast wafting up the stairs. It was dark outside, but the air felt crisp and full of possibility. And when the nurse, a woman who'd frightened Daniele into tears just a week ago, entered the room with her clothes, she discovered she could look her in the eyes and smile. Sam had never had a problem with the ones who really needed it. People who couldn't afford an operation, or whose insurance backpedaled after their houses had been destroyed in a wildfire or a flood. But there were those others. Five years after graduating from the art academy, she saw an old classmate, some smarmy, self-proclaimed performance artist, 
who had done nothing but post barely veiled plagiarisms of Rumi on his blog, asking for a year's rent on a website. His pitch, you like me, don't you? They did. That same year, the woman who had stolen her first college boyfriend funded an all-expenses-paid bacchanal to the Greek Isles. A spiritual retreat, she called it. Sam had heard otherwise. At least Sally Field worked for a living. She would griped to Berto. He hadn't gotten the reference. Other than a few close friends, Sam's likability extended itself to her mother. And Berto, who seemed like a kindred spirit when they'd met. He was from an upper-class Buenos Aires family and he shrank from such exhibitionism in the way that old money, still affable to afford privacy, did everywhere. Berto had enough wealth that Sam would never need to go begging to anyone but him. It was good timing. By then, the pundits and the politicians were adding their voices to the millions of pleas and requests, using them as examples of American generosity. It was time, they said, to leave the safety net to the network. People were innately good, after all. Look at all the success stories, at the NGOs and microloans. Why couldn't it work for welfare and public education? She watched Daniele emerge from the sliding glass doors, felt a tinge of relief and pride as the girl cheerfully greeted a passing janitor. The treatment had been rough going in the first few months, but it was working, and sometimes Sam felt a vague guilt at liking this version of her daughter better. It was like favoring one child over another, only that other child was fading, disappearing from her memory as a newer one took hold. They spent the rest of the morning shopping and visiting a museum, and Sam was delighted to see the girl demand to purchase a souvenir in the gift shop by herself. Before, she'd been too shy to approach the counter, but there she was, lapping up the attention, smiling back with all the cheeky aplomb of some 1940s child star. When they got home, Berta was waiting for them in the living room, his face drawn. Daniele he said before their coats were off. Room. Now. The girl's eyes widened as she placed her coat on the nearest hook. Is everything okay, Daddy? Sam watched her husband wince at the perfect guilelessness in the child's voice. He looked away, as if trying to avoid the eyes of a street vendor. No, he said. Go. Daniele glanced up at her mother, shrugged innocently as if to agree with her that yes, this man was crazy. Then, smiling sweetly, she strolled quietly out of the room and closed the door behind her. What is it now? Sam said. First, you say she's ignoring you. But now, when she tries to communicate, you... Berto shot her a look that made her freeze, and they waited in silence until they heard Daniele's bedroom door close. I got a call from Lena's mother, he said. Daniele and a couple of her new pals locked her out of the bathroom. She urinated on herself in the hallway... Jesus. Sam closed her eyes and rubbed the back of her neck. Are they sure Daniele was involved? Berto stretched out an arm and drummed his fingers on the edge of the sofa. Not just involved. She was the mastermind. Apparently, the bullying's been going on for weeks. They just didn't know who was behind it. Until now. Sam walked over and sat down next to him, her expression grim. But inside, she felt a strange sense of elation. If the girl was bullying another child, it meant she'd made friends, was choosing to be part of a group. That had to count as some kind of progress, didn't it? I don't know what to say about this, Berto, she said. I mean, it's not good, but kids are cruel. It's part of growing up. Is it? Sam fired a look at the closed door and lowered her voice. Things get complicated at this age. Friendships break up and kids do some pretty awful things. Not my kid. Berto said. He shifted away from her on the sofa, then stood abruptly. I'm going upstairs to talk to her, make her understand exactly what she's done. He paused as he turned to look at the door handle. I don't care if you keep her in the program, but the medication stops now. Now this little fella, said the man, is a personal friend of mine. A western basilisk come all the way from Ecuador just to be my personal necktie. The lizard was small for its type its ears jutting out like a mouse. It wriggled as the reptile man held it up by both ends, wrapping it like a balloon animal around his neck. He made a mock choking face, capped teeth glinting in the waning sunlight as the animal clung to his skin. Looks good, if I do say so myself, 
The children shrieked and clamored to get closer, and Sam craned her neck, trying to spot Danielle in the crowd. It was the first party she'd been invited to on her own, a birthday for a wealthy classmate named Carrie Ann, held at the family's seaside estate. Sam had felt a rush of pride seeing Danielle's name listed on the social register. Over time, she thought, these listings would add up. Danielle's profile would be spotted on internet fast lanes, her connections screened for colleges and clubs and job placements at the better companies. Among this group, however, she was nowhere to be seen. She remembered La Priora's tight smile as she explained the situation, that her husband wanted to go the natural route. Of course, La Priora had answered. It can work. Medication isn't everything. It was becoming apparent, however, that to Daniele it wasn't nothing either, and a month later its effects were wearing off. Now it was three months after the incident at school, and Daniele had nearly made them late. She'd holed up in the bathroom, complaining of a stomach ache, and once they arrived, stayed close to Lena, the two of them having reconciled through the force of their shared alienation. They stood at the back of the crowd as Carrie Ann unwrapped presents and took a swing at a piñata that showered its tiny guests with gift certificates and tickets to local museums. "'That accent,' said a woman. "'It's fake.' Pardon me? Sam turned to see Carrie Ann's mother sidling up to her. The woman leaned in closer as she said, Can you hear it? He's shifting between a crocodile Dundee and a London estuary. She rolled her eyes in breezy disgust and extended a hand to Sam. Don't know where my husband finds these people. Deanna Janes. Sam Clagg, she said, shaking her hand. That's very observant. I've never been to either place, actually. Deanna laughed good-naturedly, but Sam wondered if this admission might hurt her later, make her look uncultured. The two women watched in easy silence as the reptile man slung the lizard on a crate behind him and produced a snake from his pocket. He reached out and offered it up like a tin of sweets. Crikey, she's a beaut. Now then, he said, you'd like to pet this little fellow. As the children squealed and reared back, Sam scanned the crowd, hoping that Daniele might be the first to step up. The girl loved reptiles, and it would be a moment for her to shine among her privileged peers, but Danny wasn't in the crowd. She forced a smile for Deanna's sake as Carrie Ann stepped forward, her hands extended like someone anointed. The birthday girl, said the man, his accent slipping into a drawl. Sam noticed it this time as he dropped the snake into the girl's hand, smiled as it wound compliantly around the child's arm. Isn't she a dear, Sam said, backing away. As she turned, she spotted Daniele and Lena. They were across the field in the refreshment tent, hunched over a picnic table and partially obscured by the shade. Berta was there, too, she discovered, parked beside a bowl of grown-up punch. He toasted her as she approached. This is more fun than I thought, he said, offering her a cup. Peace and quiet. Sam didn't answer. He was goading her ambitions again. She took the plastic cup he offered and downed it. Berto nodded towards the two girls. I mean it. I think Danielle is having a really good time. Sam looked back. They were playing cards, some kind of fortune-telling thing, but it looked crass, like a game of poker in a back room. Who will be the one I marry? Lena said. Danielle shuffled through the cards and produced a king of spades. Ew, no way! Sam felt her body relax as the alcohol hit her and slumped down into a folding chair. You think so? She said. I'd say we're back to square one. Berto took a seat next to her. You don't get to paint it that way. Danny's working really hard to make up for what she's done. To me, that's more progress than a lot of these... these... He lifted his hand, gestured out at the piles of discarded wrapping paper overflowing onto the lawn from two enormous trash cans. In the grass, a tangle of red ribbon fluttered beneath a discarded box like a scalper's trophy. Berto gave up, dropping his hand, and took another drink. Save it for when she's forty, Berto, Sam said. She rose and walked over to the girls. Why'd you leave the show? She asked, her voice rising as her hopes sank just a little bit farther. Thought you'd be interested. He's got some pretty amazing stuff over there. Daniele looked up. Her eyes had already regained some of the grim suspicion of her previous self. I didn't like him. That's silly, Sam said. You like the boa constrictor at the zoo. 
She meant him, Lena said, nodding towards the stage. I didn't like him either. Oh, Lena, Sam thought. Not the sharpest pencil. The show was over now, with only a few of the children remaining. They dangled their legs off the stage as the late afternoon softened into dusk. Sam gripped her empty cup harder, squeezing it just tight enough to hear the plastic crackling beneath her fingers. Behind her, the canopy rustled. Ma'am? Sir? A uniformed officer ducked inside. He jabbed a thumb towards Danielle and Lena. Those your kids? Yes, Sam said. Why? The officer ignored her. All of them? Berto nodded. Yeah, everything okay? The cop held up his hand and gestured for Berto to come closer. He nodded sharply at Sam. Might I recommend you get these kids ready to leave? Sam glared at him, but the urgency in his expression set off alarms. She snatched up the card box, ignoring the girl's protests, as she gathered up a stack of queens. The cop was whispering something to Berto. Infiltrated. Parolee. Used to work as a party clown. Furious, Sam straightened. You talking about the reptile man? She said. The cop shot a worried look at the children. Ma'am, I asked a question, she said. He nodded gruffly and turned back to Berto. Private firm made a goddamn mess of things. Guy's been out for three months. Didn't light up at any of the employment agencies. Not a one. I'd get these kids home now, he said. We'll be around for questions. He slapped Berto on the back and hurried out of the tent, barking into his walkie-talkie until another voice rose above his own. A woman's voice, worried, then shrill. Carrie Ann? Deanna Jane stood in silhouette, a hand raised to her eyes as she faced the bright glare of the setting sun. It's okay, ma'am. Another officer was talking to her, trying to calm her down as he waved a small army of cops across the sand. We've got her. I told you I didn't like him said Daniele. You shouldn't have to like everybody. No, honey, Sam said, feeling her body start to shake. No, you shouldn't. She turned to her daughter, pressed the pack of cards into the girl's hands as she watched a twist of ribbon blow across the lawn, and circled Deanna Jane's ankle as she stumbled after the cop towards the beach. Thanks for listening to this month's story. We hope you enjoyed it. We're interested to hear how our listeners think this kind of work relates to or fits in with Solarpunk. The podcast is available for download on iTunes, and you can find us at solarpunkpress.com. Help Solarpunk Press become a sustainable publication by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash solarpunkpress. Our goal is to reach sustainability at $200 per month, so we can keep publishing Solarpunk stories past our 12-month trial run, but we need your help to get there. The music in this episode was by Ben Bunker. The intro was Boom Boom Box, and the outro was I Was Three. Ben's work can be heard online at soundcloud.com slash one beds. That's the number one and the word beds. Next month's story remains currently untitled by the author, but it was written by A. Gislabertus. It comes out February 1st or January 29th for folks with early release Patreon reward tiers. Thanks for listening. Until next time.